welcome to Slash Forward. This video starts what will become Saw Fridays, up until the release of Spiral on May 14th. Be sure to hit the like button if you fancy yourself a puzzle master of sorts. To start, I'll unpack the storyline to see what we can learn. Let's get to it. We open on a man taking a tubby. He wakes up suddenly and in his thrashing, his tootsie snags the plug, causing an unknown object to drain out with the water. As is the case with most bath naps, he concludes by shouting for help and finding himself chained to a pipe. As as he continues in this way, a calm, raspy voice calls out, gently kissing his ear and letting him know his efforts are futile. No point in yelling. I already tried. When this unseen partner finally locates a light switch, the full depth of their situation finally comes into view. Just a pair of shackled men destined to be bros in a dirty bathroom with an apparent self-inflicted gunshot victim on the floor between them. For me, that's just Wednesday. Dr. Lawrence Gordon introduces himself, hoping to build a rapport and learn some info. Unfortunately, Adam only remembers going to bed and waking up here, and the doctor, similarly, only remembers being on his way home from work before waking. So now, the two roomies have to reflect on why they may be here, and since they're not dead, what their kidnapper must want from them. Then the boys discover they're twinning, as they each pull evidence pouches with mini tapes out of their slacks. With a little ingenuity and a heaping dose of sheer luck, Luck, they soon acquire the tape player. Adam's tape is mostly goading him about his pathetic voyeuristic life, informing him that today he may feel free to die or actually do something about it. In contrast to this, the doctor's tape tasks him with killing Adam by 6 p.m. in order to earn his freedom and the freedom of his two closest ladies. It also identifies the third man as an unfortunate soul with so much poison coursing through his veins, he had little choice but to take control of his fate by his own hand. The ever-observant doctor also notices a faint whisper in the background of the tape and cranks it up to hear the phrase, follow your heart. He then identifies the poop heart present on the toilet tank. Failing to notice the stark, literal nature of the clues, Adam dives into the bowl, finding ancient layers of doo-doo in various consistencies. Then, upon taking a peek into the tank, he finds a bag with a couple of hacksaws in it. They get to thrusting, but the blades are too dull to cut through the heavy chains. Adam's saw quickly breaks and he sends it into the mirror. Dr. Gordon then comes to the slow realization that these implements are intended for the feet, not the chain. With these few bits of premise now established, Lawrence is starting to notice some similarities between their situation and the circumstances surrounding some other elaborate killings for which he was investigated as a suspect. So we flash back to five months prior where we meet up with police detectives, investigating a crime scene in which a man is wrapped up in a cage maze of razor wire. His tape reveals that after a failed attempt on his own life, he's being tested to verify how badly he wants to live. It appears so badly that he rushed it and killed himself on accident. The perpetrator has been deemed the jigsaw killer due to the puzzle piece shaped scrap of skin missing from the victim's body. Of course, it's pointed out that the jigsaw killer doesn't actually kill. He just finds creative ways for others to accidentally kill themselves. And you can't see it right now, but I'm making a vigorous jerking off motion with my hand. In the next scene, we find a man who has to open a safe using one of the combinations on the wall. He's been injected with the poison, is covered in a flammable goo, and was only given a tea candle to light his way. It ends predictably, and in the aftermath of this scene, it's revealed that your boy is a watcher, playfully delighting in his victim's plight. And Carrie gets to give the big reveal here that he left behind a pen light. We then transition to Dr. Gordon in brighter times, as he teaches a group of first years about inoperable brain tumors, when all they really want to do is find a nurse's room to orgy, as we've all learned in the years since this movie's release. The orderly Zepp then pops in here to let them know the patient's name is John and to infuse the room with his unsettling vibes. Detectives Tap and Sing call Gordon to his office to ask his whereabouts the previous evening, or you see his pen light was strangely found at a crime scene. He's a bit coy with his alibi, as it's attached to infidelity, the bane of every married suspected murderer. At the station, we learn that Dr. Gordon's alibi checked out, but before he goes, they request he listen to Amanda's survivor testimony to see if the details trigger anything for him. She tells the story of waking up with a heavy metal contraption on her head. A video pops on, letting her know it's essentially a reverse bear trap with a timer, and the key is in the belly of her cellmate. 
In her zeal to escape, she leaves the chair, which is what actually initiates the timer. Now she's really feeling the pressure and finds the key master to still be mostly alive. Regardless, she plunges in and plays around with his insides, until she manages to unsheath the key and release her head. The puppet then rolls out to congratulate her on what surely has become a new lease on life. At the station, she does confirm that this was an overall positive experience, as it helped her get off the drugs. As far as she knows, it's only been a few days. Back in the bathroom, they're now trying to solve this mystery, presuming it to be an intricate jigsaw-style trap. In discussing this violently, Adam recognizes that the mirror is actually made of two-way glass. He starts chucking items at it, eventually revealing a camera behind a cage. Zep gives them a little wave from the other side, but indicates he is unable to do anything for them. Recognizing all escape angles would be covered, Lawrence starts focusing on the details of their instructions, looking for the aforementioned X. He tries to put the fate of his family out of his mind, but can't help but think back to their last encounter. His daughter Diana sought his assistance with a strange man who was in her room and talking to her. Larry provided a quick room check, just to confirm she's delusional, and they share a tender moment before he's called back to work where he's a god. Then he throws his wallet to Adam so he can diddle the precious photos with his poop fingers, and as he goes to extract a family photo, he finds another piece of evidence which he keeps to himself. Back with the family, we watch him leave under unfavorable circumstances, right before Diana is abducted by a ghost. They're being held hostage by Zep, and we pan out to see that Tap is also there, obsessively staking out the doctor from across the way, while also losing his grip on reality. We dive deeper and watch as the case unfolds, and he begins his obsession, leaving his personal relationships to wither on the vine. But then a eureka moment arises when he recognizes some background graffiti that identifies the gang territory in which the video was filmed. The background sound of a fire alarm allows them to narrow things down even further, and soon Tap is ready to charge in hot and warrantless. They find a state-of-the-art workstation running a 386 with 5 megabytes of RAM, a diorama of a crime scene that we're familiar with, and then the doll from that video, and below a red velvet blanket, a work in progress. They only take a brief glance over the machinery before hearing someone return. Rather than take him there, Tap insists they hang back to catch him doing something for some reason, and the breach in protocol proves disastrous as it allows him to trip the trap to provide a distraction. He then gives them a cheeky little key ring, but they don't have time for that, so Sing shoots it into submission. In the confusion, Jigsaw is able to blade up Tap's throat before running off. Sing pursues him, shotgunning him in the back. He proceeds carefully, but not observantly, as he ends up setting off a volley of buckshot into the back of his head. Jigsaw then stumbles off to find a new space to lease, and we're brought back to modern Tap, trying to wrap this case up for the sake of his fallen comrade. Back at the room, Adam thinks about his secret clue and tries to manipulate Lawrence into turning off the lights. Just turn them off for a second! Yeah, Larry. In the dark, they find what they needed, and the doctor pops the wall tiles open to find a little treasure box of items. Inside is a cell phone and some cigarettes, with a note that coyly implies he could use them to kill Adam. Instead, Dr. Gordon gets on the horn to call the police, but the phone seems to only be capable of receiving calls. This jogs his memory of the night he was abducted. He was in a parking garage and unable to make any outgoing phone calls before being descended upon by a pig man. After establishing this, they have to work through some trust issues they have surrounding Adam's sudden intuition. He eventually relents and tosses over the photo. Lawrence then goes into his dark place, where he concocts a plan. He starts by dipping the cigarette into the poisonous blood, and then hitting the lights so he can whisper his plan to Adam in private. When the lights come back on, he slips Adam an untainted cigarette to puff on, and Adam acts his balls off to make like he's dying. However, nothing is left to chance in this moist dungeon, and a mild electrical current is introduced into his body, ending the charade. It also shakes loose a couple of Adam's mind grapes that contain his abduction memories. He was having a normal night in the darkroom, developing pictures of Dr. Gordon when he woke up with the power out. Naturally, he utilized the flash on his camera to guide him through, as one does, and eventually stumbled upon a free puppet and a terrible pig man. Then they get a call from Diana, who informs Daddy that the man from her room is there, which really comes across as kind of a petty I told you so. Then Allie gets on the line and warns him not to believe anything Adam says, as he knew Lawrence before today. When confronted, they each get indignant about which of the two is the biggest shithead, with Adam scattering the evidence to support his point all over the floor. We see, however, that Dr. Gordon only went to the sleazy hotel that evening to tell his mistress that he wanted to 
not have sex with her. Live your truth, King. Insistent that the man who hired Adam to follow him around must be the one responsible for their predicament, he pressures him for whatever info he can remember. But there was just nothing remarkable about him whatsoever. No defining characteristic that really stands out at all. Except maybe it means something that he had a large scar across his neck? We then learn that Tap went a little nutty after losing his partner and has been investigating Dr. Gordon solely as a concerned citizen, since he's no longer an officer of the law. The doctor then crumbles to the floor lamenting his wretched fate, while back at his home, old Zepp is getting ready to pack it in for the night. And then time, the most important variable that they haven't yet discussed, runs out. Allie calls him up to let him know that he failed, but then easily disarms her persecutor. Through the struggle, several shots are fired, which sets Tap into motion. He lays down some cover fire, allowing the ladies to escape, but Zepp is able to momentarily put Tap's lights out, allowing him to set the kill routine before stumbling off with a freshly conscious Tap close behind. Back in the room, Lawrence gets zapped, which pushes him nearly to his limit. Then a call comes in and he's driven mad by his inability to reach it. He gets that crazy look in his eyes and resolves to do what must be done. And he absolutely ruins his racquetball career as Adam looks on screaming in terror. Meanwhile, Tap has been following Zep through town, all the way back to the official lair. He catches up with him and counts off his troubles on his face and body, but ultimately gets shot. Concurrently, now free, the doctor loads his bullet into the available gun, aims for center mass, and takes his shot. Not knowing that his family is actually now safe at the neighbor's residence. Then Zep pops in to see how the boys are getting along, and reveals that the rules of the game are strict, so late kills don't count. He prepares to do Lawrence when Adam pops up with the second win and goes to town with the tank lit, turning his face into hamburger meat. Afterward, the two hug it out like brothers, and Lawrence resolves to go get some help. Adam passes the time looking for something useful on Zepp's person, and finds that he had his own tape player and was another mere pawn in the Jigsaw's deadly game. Then, the dead body begins to move, revealing himself to be the mastermind and informing Adam that the key he needs to escape was right in the tub, so he's surprised he didn't find it. And anyway, we learn this is John from the hospital, dying of terminal cancer and driven to vengeance against all the able-bodied individuals who he watched daily squander their time and fail to appreciate the preciousness of life. He then gives Adam a parting zap and unrepentantly closes him into the dark room. With that now established, let's get to the question of whether you could survive this ordeal. This one's a bit of a toughie. I don't remember much about the rest of the series, but I know it begins to lean much more heavily on featuring elaborate traps involving scenarios of moral dilemmas. Honestly, there wasn't really much of that present here. It was hinted at, but not fully explored or featured in most scenarios. I point this out as impactful because in many of the trap situations, it honestly seemed like they were manufactured solely with the intent of causing death, with little actual chance of finding a way to escape or earn your freedom. The first step to max out your likelihood for survival would be, as has been discussed before, to make sure you pause a moment to find your center clarity, peace, serenity, so you can evaluate your surroundings. Many of the traps were set up like a speed run with a frantic pace intended to ensure failure. In at least two situations, cautious expedience could have been greatly helpful. In Amanda's case, jumping up suddenly is what started her countdown. She had almost unlimited time before that. In the case of Detective Singh, the cobwebs in the hallway implied Jigsaw took a different path around indicating high probability of a nearby trap. These key observations were missed by rushing through recklessly. Also, as pointed out by Dr. Gordon, most pathways out were already covered by Jigsaw. For instance, when the drill trap popped off, my first thought was what this poor lad was even supposed to do to earn his freedom or learn from his fate. His chair completely inhibits interacting with his surroundings. But with others present, it seemed like an easy matter of powering the system down. Even though this is likely a completely unnecessary factor given the intended use of the trap, a few brief frames indicate that Jigsaw did install shielding to remove that possibility. Of course, this leads to Singh employing his universal problem solver to shoot this trap's proverbial dick off. Unfortunately, this is a case of special use. Guns would have provided little to no advantage in any of the other traps. Also, if we rely on the gun's capacity to remove problems, we'd have to then acknowledge the concept of problem is subjective, working just as effectively in service of Jigsaw, and then everything would just turn into a boring old shootout. So, given these factors and with little else to work on, we're somewhat limited. The safe trap and drill chair are complete non-starters. There is no viable way out of them. You'd probably have a greater than 65% chance of making it through the
the wire cage. The victim had two hours. There was no need to rush. The bear trap could be higher or lower than that, depending on whether it would be an inhibiting factor that you'd have to hurt someone else rather than having all the danger resting with you. After that, this first movie doesn't really have many more traps in the traditional sense. I mean, do we consider Sing? And what about Zep? He was in the middle of his own pizza bomber situation throughout the entire movie, and the final room was set up to be less about intricate contrivances and more about a devastating final reveal. Does that count as a trap? If so, I can honestly say that I'd check the toilet tank first to avoid the poop, and if there was nothing in the tank, I would simply die. Other than that, there are so many circumstances that need to unfold just right here, I'm not sure how you can predict or affect the outcome. If Adam hadn't lost the key, it would have changed how some of the events unfolded, but their objectives were still the same. You would have to have somehow ended the game unchained with a loaded gun and some way of ensuring the door was open, otherwise you're probably going to die. The movie makes it seem like the police hadn't moved beyond Dr. Gordon as the main suspect, even after Jigsaw killed one of their own. With neither of them having any clear connection to John, there's no way they could have figured out the mystery before time ran out, which is really the most important factor, and is confusingly the one thing that they rarely ever talked about. The games are set up to accomplish a task in a particular time or die. Remember that Zep was watching, and Jigsaw was in there with them and had his hands on a zapper. The only real way to have gotten out of this, outside of our wildest assumptions, was for Dr. Gordon to acquire the gun and land a headshot from across the room. With that in mind, this is sounding a lot like a 5% or less scenario, and I am so sorry, but I think you would die. Before we go, I'd like to give a huge thanks to my donors memorialized in the Hall of Headshots. As an FYI, I have a website set up where you can support the channel through donations or merch. Any donation unlocks uncensored movie reviews of Life Force and Under the Skin, with others to be added over time. And if you enjoyed the video, I'd love for you to become a part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.